I feel surrounded. <laughs> Welcome to the tree tutorial. I've been living here for a while inside of it and making trees. So I'm really excited to share this project with everyone. Um, we are going to make armature structured wet and needle felted trees using a variety of techniques and textures, um, all different foliage, and I'm going to try to cover a lot of different possibilities in one tutorial. Today I am working from, the trees were inspired by a fiber fairy giveaway that was March 31st, 2023. And um, if you're watching this at a later date, I will cover the supplies that are needed, but um, I'm going to work today with fiber that was in the giveaway. And I'm going to cover also talk about the tools that you'll need and the wires and the supplies. So we need 12 and 14 gauge armature wire. That was sort of the best combo that I found for these. I used about three pieces of 24 inch 12 gauge and two to five, depending how many branches you want, pieces of um, uh, 14 gauge aluminum wire. And 22 gauge cloth covered wire in black or brown, whichever, whichever you prefer. Uh, definitely have some of that on hand. I really like the, the dark tacky wrap sticks for this project. Um, some people don't like working with the sticky and if you don't, then get yourself some 26 gauge dark wires. And then in terms of tools, I do wet felting to make the bark, but if you don't like to wet felt, you can needle felt your bark as well. And you don't have to wet felt for this project, but I am going to show it. Um, have some fabric scissors or those um, real sharp little snips available, pliers, and then um, we have on our goods and faves page, and you'll see in the tutorial where these come up, these cool scissors that have a wave to them and that helps cut the leaves. Also on the goods and faves page, we have a beautiful book, um, a beautiful tree book linked and it's a great, it's a beautiful book just to have, but it's a, it's a fun source to get inspired. Um, the power wax, the cold wax medium is helpful, not necessary. You also could use swax and or tacky wrap to help you with some of the wrapping process. And then I have uh, the fiber, which I'll talk about in one second. As always, I encourage you to watch the tutorial before you place your order or consider what kind of tree you make or how you want to approach it because so much information is in the tutorial that's going to help you sort of put together your vision and understand the roadmap of where you're heading with it and, and what you need and how to go. So for the fiber, I'm using coffee bean um, core. At times we have brown core. You could even use um, carob or a gray core depending on your tree. So about two ounces of core is needed. And then for this tutorial, I'm using a mix of greens and I'll show how to blend those. Could be any green color combination. This one is leaf and olive merino vibrant green, top coat and sage tussa silk. And then I have a variety of browns and grays for the bark. Again, it could be a, a wide variety of, of options there. I think today I use nut and chocolate merino with almond and redwood top coat, um, and then um, chocolate, chocolate tussa silk. And we have a textured yarn that was included in the giveaway, but that as we move forward with boodles and tree supplies in general, we hope to have in stock. In addition to uh, green and or pink, uh, this is a house dyed yarn 
to create the cherry blossoms. The green could be used for pine or for weeping willow, which I'm hoping to make down the road. I haven't prepared one of those yet. So, and then we have the autumn, um, autumn fiber art locks with the autumn colorway. Locks are another great way to approach your foliage and that's how this that's how this tree was made so tons of options lots to sort of absorb and consider and um hopefully as i go through the tutorial you'll you'll get an understanding of how all this comes together and i hope you find it as much of a joy to do as i have i've really enjoyed exploring this and putting it together and experimenting with all of the techniques, including the wisteria that I made behind me. That's one really cool thing about this is it can be scaled up or down and it's all the same techniques. So, and I don't think there's anything out there like it as far as, as far as I can see, um, that gives us sort of leaning towards a more realistic tree. So let's get started. First thing, that we are going to do together is make our armature. And I have here three 12 gauge wires cut, you know, between 22 and 24 inches. And I have two 14 gauge wires. And I am going to make a, um, I think I'm going, I think I decided that I was going to make a, a cherry blossom. Yep. Yeah. And how long are your 14 gauge wires? My 14 gauge wires are also about 20 to 22 inches. Okay. Yeah. I made them a little shorter because they will be a low, a smaller, a smaller branch. Okay. So to get started, we're going to hold our wires. I am not worried about lining them up perfectly. I have one that's a little longer, some are a little shorter. So I just have them generally gathered together. And when I twist three wires, I like to, um, I like to like make them into a teepee, make them into a triangle. And that way I can get my fingers in there and get all three wires to to twist together um, into a rope versus, you know, one of them not moving and the other two going around it or any version of that. I'm not, for this tree, I'm not gonna twist too far before I want the, um, the branches to divide, the trunk to divide. There's probably a name for that. And I want to leave about four, four to five inches of, of roots. You, just like a real tree, we need the root structure to hold the tree up. Whether your tree sits on a surface that way or becomes incorporated into another project where, you know, the roots get buried and you don't even see them, it doesn't matter. Um, it's, it is the tree stand basically. Now, if I were making an oak or a pine, I could keep twisting these and let them branch out higher. Another possibility is to take two and let them keep going a little bit. So now I have one coming off and two going up. See, already we have a tree. Yes. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> now the 14 gauge, we're gonna make some more branches. So I can just kind of see, you know, where, where do I want this and how far out do I want it? And then wrap it in, in the same, whoops, I'm saying in the same and I'm not going in the same. There we go. No, that's going across it. Okay, into the same twist that the 12 gauge are. So it all, it all blends in. 
and then this will become a root. How many branches? It's like antlers. <laughs> How many branches you decide to make? Totally up to you. You can you could keep going. It's just it becomes it just becomes a lot of work. So as always, we advise watch the tutorial, figure out where you're headed and where we're going with it, and then you can more easily make your decisions about um, how you want yours yours to be. So I might take this maybe onto this. Do something like that. So you could you could cut more wires and have more. Um, what I found was that with the twig and foliage process, it's not hard to um, to make these look fairly full with less gigantic branches. At this point, using 22 gauge cloth covered wire is a great way to get some grip on your aluminum wire and also have some branch offshoots. So I want to make sure that all of my aluminum wire has some 22 gauge cloth covered wire on it. So I can leave a section of wire to wrap my root and then take the rest of it up. So at Max's work, they have like tree pun wars. <laughs> All right, I, I, always, I always twist my wires together in my wrong direction. So when I get here, I'm going to twist that in my, my proper wrapping direction. Same with the roots. I like leaving a little bit of the 22 gauge wire sticking off. That gives me a really nice tapered, tapered end. So this one, I think I will just span the roots here and do one down each root. This is definitely also a poke yourself in the eye project, so be careful. I'm going to cut a little bit of this off. What have you learned about trees? Well, a lot just sitting here. <laughs> Aww. Absorbing it. I really think this project for those people who are um, perfectionists you are in danger of kind of making yourself crazy because um, trees are very complex and detailed and um, we have to we have to allow the techniques and the fiber to create that um, unless you want to spend a long long time building your tree um, we are losing a lot of detail at the scale. You also have to be able to be random, which is yes, yes, can be hard. Yes, I'm going to show you all kinds of ways to be random, including your wacky wire lengths. So right now I'm just putting, making sure there's cloth wire on everything. Why did the pine tree get in trouble? I don't know. Something about sapper needles. <laughs> uh, it, it was being naughty. 
Naughty. Naughty. K N O T T Y. I feel like pine trees are not like. Don't they have knots? Yes, I guess they do. Yeah, once um, everybody sees how this works, <laughs> I feel like at the beginning it's always this, this is big mystery. I know where I'm going. Um, but once you see how this works, you'll be able to run with it. It's not quite long enough. We'll go here. I have a question for you. Okay. What happened to the wooden car with wooden wheels and a wooden engine? It wouldn't go. It wouldn't go. <laughs> that is the armature in its simplest, simplest form. Um, I can add some, a few 22 gauge branches. I'm not going to go too, too crazy with it. Let's see. Let's, let me cut a few in half and then put, I'm going to put four 22 gauge offshoots on here. And I just turn it around and look look for places that make sense or need to be filled in. Um, I will get out a picture of a cherry blossom. Max's tree company should uh, do like the intellectual day and they could compare proverbs. Yeah, there's a lot of tree proverbs. I wanted to get, I tried to get them to come and be in the video. They weren't biting. <laughs> but wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. All their gear. Max is telling me stories about being up in the trees. Said he was crazy. He said, well, he said he was 120 feet high. That was a cherry picker. But then he said, told me about being up on a branch and shimmying out 15 feet away from the... It's like, I'm like, la, 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 la. Hooked into something. Yes. yes, yes, they are. They are. He's a little climber. He's always been fearless. Um, so Next, this is, we're going to leave this. At this point and um, start to blend our fiber so that we can wet felt our leaves and our bark. So I'm going to move, um, even though today I'm going to work with the yarn, I am going to show the leaf and the lock techniques. So I'm just going to get these, uh, these things out of the way for now. And I'm going to create a green. Now, I'm going to blend fiber. You, you could find a green that you love just as it is. It's fine. It doesn't have to be um, super, you know, vari variegated or textured or anything. But, like, to me, I didn't see the green that is exactly the way that I want it. So I'm blending some things together. And I'm going to use hand carters, but in actuality, I have the benefit of a drum carter, and that is much faster. So that's probably what I'll what I will end up end up using. 
So my three merino, my merino, the two merinos and the top coat color, I can load up. It's helpful to, um, with the drum carter because your fiber comes off in a big bat, which makes it very easy to wet felt. Whereas the hand carters, um, you know, it takes a little more to prepare your, prepare your fiber. And I'm just adding a smaller amount of silk. I don't want as much silk. There's a possibility we've been working on um, adding blending boards to our inventory. So that might be a little bit of a shortcut if you don't have a drum carter. But that's it. This doesn't have to be um, blended into one color. It's going to get uh, wet felted and then, you know, further indistinguishable by being made into leaves. So I'll just do it one more time. A tree falls the way it leans. Proverb. That's that that is that's some deep stuff right there. No, I relate I relate to that one. If you're gonna lean, you better have some some good roots. <laughs> I also like this one. A tree does not move unless there is wind. Hmm. That's interesting. Is that a proverb or just a... a uh, an Afghan proverb. According to the internet. To give you an idea, we'll jump ahead. The, we need about, on a wet felting kit, a big one, you need about half or half to two thirds green and a little bit less brown. Unless you want to make a trunk trunk fiber and then you'll have it for two or three trees. You could do half and half. But you need about half of a wet felting um, surface for, for the leaves. Okay, so for the brown, I'm just doing the same thing. I'm going to take, I keep saying brown, but really trees generally, trunks generally lean a little bit more towards gray. I love nut. You could use ash. You could use earth. Um, I'm not going to put too much chocolate in. Redwood's awesome. It has lots of beautiful, cool variations in it. I think it has like a purple in it and a little bit of a green. And almond is just a great gray. Why did the tree need to take a nap? I don't know why. Forest. Forest. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. I gotta, can you, can we uh, print these out for mix? <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of them are pretty corny, but a lot of eye could, rolling in this future. Guy. <laughs> This one for sure at his work. Would you rather climb stairs or a tree? Yeah. Personally, I prefer the latter. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> that is a really good one. <laughs> the jokes are like my tutorial filming treat. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have to prepare them. <laughs> Uh, 
I really hope you guys have fun uh, with this project. I sure have. There's so many colors and um, tech, like the different foliage, the yarn, the locks. We have fiber art locks in all kinds of fun colors that you don't have to be literal. You know, you could you could do a bronze. I love bronze is one of my favorite ones. Um, the I'll, when I do some wet felting, I'll show you. You know, the wisteria was made just at a different scale. I wet felted the green just like we're gonna wet felt this green, and um, the I did a hand spun for the to represent the flowers. So you don't have to make a tree, you can make a branch. Um, you could make a bonsai. You could make like what you're really trying to create, a little bonsai. So, okay, so blend away and then we will set up for wet felting. I have my fiber blended. I was just thinking as I was using my handy dandy drum carter, if you don't you know, want to use hand carters or hand blend fiber, there are other house carded bats in the, um, on the website that you can peruse to see if there's a color that you like. So we were looking at burrow is a nice brown gray. Um, timber landscape bat. Timber landscape bat. Sprout is a mm -hmm. house carded green. So I have about an ounce and a half of my bark color. I do not need that much for a tree. Like I said, if we wet felt this, it could even make two trees. But no matter, you want to save about a third for wrapping. Um, we do need to do some wrapping on the branches at the end. So save some of your brown for um, finishing out your tree details. Don't, don't wet felt it. So this piece, I think I'm going to split in half and create a crisscross. If you don't have a bat, you can take your take your blended fiber or your roving or and lay it out and when you do so crisscross so that you have fiber running in different directions. But since I do have a bat, I'm going to lay it vertically and horizontally. This is probably a little bit thick, so I'm going to take a little bit more of that off. I need it to be solid. I don't need it to be very thick, like as far as a needle felting, I mean a wet felting project goes. Okay, then going vertically, because that we do want to have a little bit of an orientation for our bark pattern. And I, I left this purposely slightly, you know, less blended so that it had some variation. I can take my yarn and begin to create some texture. And any other yarn that you have that goes, I mean, throw it in there. Like really wet felting is a great opportunity to mix up what you're doing it, and it get that randomness. Be, it needs to be wool. This or this actually hair, does, or... this does not have a high content of wool, so I will have to put a little bit of oh, fiber okay. on top of it. Could someone use acrylic yarn with wool on top and underneath? You or could. It it's, some wool? it's better if it has some wool because then it's it's sure to cling. And um, so I could even take some pieces and twist it and make a bigger kind of a bigger splash, basically. Or if you had a thicker yarn, you could lay. Uh, thicker yarn pieces in there. So 
So could someone needle felt the bark? Sure. Yep. You'll have a different finished look, yes. I would use the same process. I would basically make a bark pelt okay. because it's really nice to be able to put it right onto the tree in one piece. If you're trying to either, if you wrap, you're going to get the wrapped look. If you're, if you're doing it piece by piece, it's very laborious. When you, when you just do a flat 2D piece, whether it's this um, wet felted or needle felted, you can just stab away, get it all flat, and then, and then put it on. My tendency would be to take this even a little more wacky, um, but I'm sticking to what some of the fiber that we have here. And then the green, same thing. I want to create a double layer. I found that when I made the leaves in this way, um, it's important to wet felt this pretty well, like a little firmer than I usually achieve. Because you're, um, once this is wet felted, we're cutting it into strips, and then we're cutting those strips into, into leaves. And I will um, show all of this, but th sort of this is where you're heading. So if it's not really well felted, this could be fuzzy and and come apart. So this is this is like borderline <laughs> what I what I made. That that does look a good bit like sprout. If someone really wants mm -hmm. bats. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you don't have to do this. You could needle felt. Um, you could needle felt your trunk. You could use the yarn or the locks instead of this. I'd say that this technique of these green leaves with the wet felted is the longest, the most time intensive because you're wet felting the leaf and you've got to cut the strips. Um, whereas the yarn or the locks, they're pretty much just ready to go. You do have to cut them and mess with them a little bit, but all right, that feels, that feels good to me. I think that's good. Some people really like the tedious detail. Oh, I need to fussing. put a little top coat on this, um, where my yarn is. Yeah. Um, what I like about wet felting is the, the, the happy accidents that happen. So that's why I enjoy it. The texture that it creates and so just very thin top coat layer. If I wanted to sort of glaze this in a different direction, I could even use just one of the colors. Like I could use almond and do my thin layer in one color. But this will grab that, um, that texture yarn that I put on there. How many wet felting holdouts do you think we have out there? I don't know. Don't know. Another cool thing you could do I mean, it just goes on and on. You could do your layer darker, put your yarn, and then put your top coat in a lighter value, and then you're going to get um, like a more creased looking bark because you're going to have the contrast of of light and dark. So I have uh, warm, soapy water. What's the best day for so photos, photosynthesis? Uh, oh, wait. Let's 
Sunday. Yes. <laughs> I started at Monday, so it took me a while. <laughs> My sister came and worked in the shop on Saturday, and we wet felted. Oh. We were making kelp. Um, Soggy oh. the Soctopus on Instagram, if you want. <laughs> Soggy the Soctopus. He's a sock octopus. Wow. Yes. And he's having adventures. He's So he needed kelp. He needed a little oh, nest. Oh, yeah. And... Um, his mode of on land travel is a hot air balloon. So <laughs> she's making, she's trying to make a hot air balloon that actually is a hot air balloon. Anyway, she was like, What is this? This. She's oh. like, Is this for wet feltings? I said, Yes. <laughs> like, she was all impressed with the, the tools of the tree. So as I'm adding water, I'm pressing down, and wherever there's like a, a poof that needs more water, it's not. It's not saturated yet. So that's how I tell when I have enough water. I don't want, I want it to just get over that edge. I don't want, um, I don't want it much more wet than that. And I'm going to stop there for a second because I feel like if I press this around, it'll be enough. And I think I was right. So wet felting, we always start off pretty gentle. You're just trying to start to encourage everything to get along and be together as one. Um. How does one find a teeny tiny life preserver? One makes a teeny tiny <laughs> life preserver and the little sailor hat. Soggy this octopus. He he visited us. Did are there? Do you see? Uh, yes. He was here. He yes. met Karina. I see that. He found a mermaid. They. He's these. They, they are they. That, that's an impressive life vest. <laughs> I know, it's so cute. <sighs> People think, you know, I'm, I'm creative. I am creative. My sister is a whole nother, <laughs> whole nother wacky level of creative. She's like, what unusual weird thing that nobody has ever done before can I do? And that's what she does. She likes to make things for everybody to enjoy. So she, she's done great big puppets for parades. And she makes and gives away quilts and all kinds of stuff. So at about this phase, I want to lift my voile. You can see all the green that's coming through. And so I want to lift the voile off of our uh, wet felting fiber and make sure it's not totally stuck to it. And then once you do this once, it, it, you don't really have to do it again. It won't, it won't stick again. Feel like the green is a little more than yeah. So now I can put it back and just keep it going. You have a green. Way. You have a green lump on your bark. A lot of a lot of goobers. A lot of green goobers. <laughs> Now I want to keep going, and then um, I'll flip these over and do a little more, and then we'll start rolling. A proverb to think about, mm -hmm. a little axe can still cut down a big tree. I like that.
Big trees cast more shadow than fruit. Just flipping these over so that I can go at the other side. Big trees cast more shadows. I don't, I, I'm not following that one. Is that, is that actually true? Well, you're, I don't understand because like, is, it feels obvious to me. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> I misunderstood. Yeah, no, but I'm wondering if it's actually true. But do you know how I heard it? I heard it that a big tree shadow is bigger than a fruit shadow. <laughs> That's what I heard. Not that a big tree makes bigger shadows than it makes more fruit. Yeah. Yeah, I, I heard it wrong. So in my brain, I was going, no, duh. <laughs> I'm just wondering if that's, if that's actually true. true. I don't know. So, I mean, it makes sense because then a tree is feeding itself. It's feeding, it has to feed all of it. One of the things that we have on our Goods and Faves page is a beautiful book that Kyla found um, published by the Smithsonian or, or created by the Smithsonian. Um, and that's linked on our Goods and Faves page. A very nice, high-quality book for the, this is 30, at this time, mm -hmm. $33. Mm -hmm. um, really enjoyed looking through that. It's full of art and stories and information, not just, it's not just tree identification. or. Yeah, it's very cool. It's funny, you know, when you wet felt and start getting used to doing it, you can really feel what's happening underneath your hands where the fiber is. So I can feel this still shifting around a bit. It's not, you, you know, totally united yet. But I'm going to flip it back over to the front, which isn't totally necessary, but I just like to check on things. And then I'll start rolling. The green does not matter. There's not really a front or back. But the brown does have a the barky side. So much tree wisdom on the internet. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln said, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four sharpening the axe. Ooh, that's a good one. So I roll everything around the pool noodle, not everything, not the towel, from the, um, <laughs> from the pool, from the bubble wrap up. And then I use the towel to hold everything together. And I am not going to roll on film because the table is going to shake you and it's will not going get, to be pretty. You will get nauseous. But um, you want to go, go back, like, so that's one, two, three, four. Do a hundred times each direction. I was doing like 75, but then it wasn't quite tilted it up. So a hundred times each direction and a change of direction is um, orienting your pool noodle from go around the bubble wrap, so 90 degrees, and go from that end. I'll show it, I'll show a change of direction. So I went 100 times my first direction, and I'm just gonna show how I change direction. It's easiest for me to just take the whole bundle, turn it 90 degrees, and unroll it. Now the turn is already done and I know I'm coming from the short end now. And I'm gonna do 100 rolls this way. Oh, 
All right, I went 400 times, and now I'm going to see where we are. The bark, I don't mind um, if it's more of in a kind of a pre-felt state because I am going to needle felt it onto the tree. But the, the leaf color, we really need to be well felted. So I think I'm going to spend a minute just hand felting that, see if I can get it to tighten up because it is a little bit still, um, a little still fibers can be pulled off and um, I just get tired of rolling. And I think yeah. maybe this works faster. You, you can roll it on itself and you're not in danger of it felting to itself. How do you identify a math tree? Math? Yeah, everyone, you know, knows about math trees. <laughs> uh, I don't know how. It, it has square roots. I think one thing that helps this process for this kind of thing is that textured um, shelf liner that we have. Want me to get you some? No, no, I'm good. I'm just throwing suggestions out there. Oh, much better. Now it's, I can't pull. I can't pull fibers apart. So as you go, the, the more and more firm you can be. Alrighty, I'm going to take these over to our sink and do a hot and cold rinse two or three times until all the soap is out. And then I'm going to put them in the spinner and then put them in the sun. If you don't have a spinner after you wring them out, you can roll them up in a towel and twist it and try to just get as much moisture out as you can. But they'll be, they'll be dry in no time. So we have our wet felted fabric is drying and I'm going to start wrapping my armature. This is pretty straightforward, so I'm not going to demonstrate the entire uh, process because it just it's just busy work. But I'm using coffee core. And like I said, you could use a variety of things. As I was rinsing out my wet felting, I was thinking about neps um, we've done a few different tutorials like the turtle skin the frogs that that are about getting a lot of texture the forest floor so you could ch cross check those tutorials for ways to get uh, texture in your wet felting there's no you know super like we pass me the one that's near you you can approach this a lot of different ways but basically everything needs to get wrapped and then we're going to create some random, um, like some random irregular shapes, some irregularities. So I like to start with half halves, just it's easier to handle. And I, like I said, I always twist my wire the, the opposite way that I wrap, which is a 
problem on skinny things, but not a problem on big chunky things. And watch your eyes. <laughs> and I found that generally I use the mini stab it with this project because it is just handy to to get it kind of tucked in here and there um, wherever you need to, whenever you need to stab something. But I tend to wrap this without stabbing. I just wrap tightly and I get my fringy edges to stick um, without a lot of stabbing until the end. Um, a 36 gauge needle is handy on this because there's times you just, you just need that grab on a big project like this, especially when we're attaching our bark and you want it to stick, so. And allow some weirdness here. This isn't a case where we're going for, you know, perfectly even, perfectly smooth. So don't be afraid. to let some irregularity happen. If you are making something that you want to be really like craggly and random, give your wires a couple of sharp bends and then do the crisscross joint wrap there. And that will sort of accentuate that kind of look. But piece by piece, <laughs> I'm going to wrap the entire thing, keeping in mind that as I move out away from the trunk, I want the branches to be um, tapered. When I branch off of one branch, I usually go around the branch from each way so that it has a nice um, even separation rather than just wrapping the one direction which will um, not anchor it as evenly. Do make sure that your core color is similar to your trunk color. It just makes it a lot easier when we're near the end and we're trying to cover all these little twig wires if you don't have to cover all of your core um, meticulously. So even here, if your piece tapers, really just a twist will hold it. If you feel like you need a little bit of cold wax there, that works really well. I'll show that technique down the road here. And then roots as well. Initially, it's just wrapping, um, but there are a couple of, couple of steps I want to show you to make sure it looks very tree-like. But initially, we just have to get the whole thing, the whole thing covered. Great oaks grow from little acorns. Mm -hmm. Trees are definitely a proverb. Yeah, like there's a lot. <laughs> Plethora of proverbs. Don't expect a cherry tree from an acorn. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of like you reap what you sow. Like plant, mm -hmm. plant what you manifest, what you want to manifest. I 
All right, I'll show the um, craggly branch idea. So I'm just going to put like a sharp, a couple sharp bends in my branch and then wrap. And when I wrap, I'm going to do the same crisscross that we do when we make animal <laughs> hocks and joints. So I'm going to go back this way and then proceed this way. Yeah, so it makes like a little, makes a little tree joint. This one I've got bent the other way. So I'm going to skip the, I'll exaggerate it. I'm going to skip the corner. I'm going to come up here. So I'm trying to skip this part, scoot right up here, then go back and then do it again. And that gives me that bump. So there you go. I made a very, a very bumpy one. So I wrote down some weights I want to share so that everybody kind of gets an idea of how much, how much fiber they need. The autumn tree was a two ounce bag of locks plus a little bit. So, and I do feel like I went a little too dense closer to the trunk. So if you keep, if you keep your two ounces <clears throat> sort of out, um, closer to the canopy, it should be good. But that's, that's just to give you a ballpark. That's where you want to be. Um, the cherry blossom, the cherry, the weeping cherry. Now keep in mind every on the branch, all of the pieces are, are longer than I'm going to make this one a cherry blossom. So the pieces are going to be shorter. So for a long, um, a weeping plant, like if you did that with green and you made a weeping willow, you're going to want more like three to four ounces of yarn. But I have a feeling that the cherry blossom with the little short, shorter pieces will be less than two ounces. And I have not weighed the, um, the green yet. But I think for all of them, you're looking about two to four ounces of foliage to get your tree looking nice and full. The oak, the autumny oak itself is in total four and a half ounces. Hmm. A good yeah, bit of wire? Pretty. I mean, wire is some of the weight. Yeah, it's pretty light. I mean, I think a moose is mm. four and a half ounces. All right, so keep wrapping, and then I'm going to show you the next step. So I looked at pictures of cherry blossoms, and there some of them are like real stylized and twisty. So I took my armature and I just twisted it. Mm. Yeah, I just went like like that. And so it kind of gave me like a little bit of a, this is what I'm talking about, like mess it up. So I'm going to go for when I finish wrapping here, a little more irregularity. kind of just um, exaggerate or um, emphasize these weird bends I'm putting in here. It's 
Scottish proverb. You okay. ready? If I could do a good Scottish accent, I would. <laughs> uh, he that would eat the fruit must climb the tree. Mm-hmm. That's that um, children's little children's fable of the. Who didn't want to make the bread? Was it little chickens? Somebody didn't want to make the bread, but then they wanted to eat the bread. Is that Henny Penny? Maybe. Tell me about Henny Penny. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more about Henny well, Penny. <laughs> is it the sky is falling, people? I don't know, but it's not tree related. And, so they're, not, really... and they're not people. <laughs> they're um, not people. You're, you're referring to the little red hen. The little oh, red the hen. little red hen. Wait, is that the sky is falling? No, they not wanting to participate, but wanting the... Bread? Wasn't it bread? I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, if you want to eat the fruit, you either got to plow some land or prune some trees or climb the trees. Help out. So I, I like this more sort of asymmetrical kind of look. Okay, now now is the fun part. It's all fun. Don't listen to me. We're going to make little weird shapes. So this one has it. You can see I put um, like basically faces or Zoli tool or pencil bumps all over it. And it's a great time to use up your little random pieces from wrapping your tree. So using these little bits, I'm going to make shapes, random number, random shapes, random sizes, just by wrapping around the tool. I make a big flat one for somewhere. Whenever you make shapes on a tool, out and back is the rule because that holds all the fiber together. If you just go one direction, it's going to spiral apart when you take it apart. So these are going to give us some texture and interest underneath the bark. Do peanuts grow on trees? They're a vine. They're like a... A, a bush? <laughs> yeah, they're not, they're not a tree. They're also really weird because it grows upwards. Mm -hmm. And then it has vines that hang down, and then the legumes grow back in the ground. Wow, I don't think I've ever seen a peanut plant, whatever we're calling it. I just realized before I put these on, I want to do a wrap around my roots to start to build the root crown. So I'm going to take a relatively long piece, about 10 inches, and split it in half. And then... I, I wrap with my left hand away from me, so yours will look like this. But you want to go around the base of a root and then skip over top to the next root and then go around that one, skip over top. I kind of knew the peanuts grew in the ground. Yeah, I sort of knew. I knew it was a little but weird. That's but that's weird. Yeah. Like they really go, grow in the ground. Is the actual nut in the ground? Are they actually a legume and not a nut? They, you like dig them out of the ground. They come up dirty, like carrots. Yeah, wow. Alrighty. I don't think I want to go too much wider on this trunk. Um, okay, 
So now I'm going to take my shapes and begin creating a little more randomness. So I'll put one there. I like to put some at the base of the base of the trunk meeting the roots. This are like some trees that actually have these roots are called buttress roots and they're sort of roots that come up out of the ground and hold the tree up. There's a famous kind of tree. I forget what it's called. Can you picture it? The base of it, it's like these big, oh, I forget. I forget what it's called. I think it's in the book. Another good spot for these shapes is right where a branch is joining your trunk. I'm tacking them on. I'm not going too crazy with the needle felting. Just making sure it's stuck where I want it. The silk cotton tree, the kapok. Oh, I don't know. They have huge ones. I feel like it's like a swampy tree or something that I should know the name of and I'm totally blanking on it. Cy no. Sequoias? Is it the cypress? No, not I cypress. I thought cypress too, but cypress are like an evergreen. Yeah. And then here's another weird thing. As you're working on your tree, you're going to bend it all kinds of ways and then you can bend it back. So don't worry too much about some perfect shape or anything because it's going to get handled a lot and change a lot. I really like I like this. I like the way it's kind of exaggerating what what I made here. Yeah, get weird with it. I want to make one where I get really weird with the bark. I haven't I haven't done that. Although the 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 wisteria bark is pretty fun but it's a much larger scale so to hold these shapes I could do one more skinny wrap I'm not worried about the ones at the base here but I'm gonna do one more wrap to tuck everything in Are you thinking the banyan tree Ah, oh, that's what I am thinking. Doesn't it have like big buttressy roots at the bottom? Mm-hmm. So when we see that little hole in the bark, like a little owl hole, a yeah, squirrel what happened? hole, I don't know. They're called wounds. And then the, the rounded bark around it is called a callus. I'll show you how, I, how I'm making those. So you could look up what causes a tree wound and callus, maybe. Yeah, I like when the trees look like they've been a little bit sort of distorted or shaped by nature, you know, a little kind of off kilter. Hard to see from the overhead. I'm going to show it in the front one. We want to wrap our roots in our, well, if you're not showing them, you could leave them in the brown. That's fine. I was going to wrap them in my, um, in my bark color. And I'll just show a couple and then move on. <laughs> but 
I think I think it's more interesting. It's a really pretty color. Gives it a nicer look. So people cause more wounds. Okay, than nature. Yes. But also animals. Or like a storm. Mm -hmm. So when I get to the tip, just try to let my fiber taper naturally. And then get some cold wax and slime it on there and just press it, press it. You could even do the whole, if you really wanted like a smooth look, you could even do the whole root. But it does really, does look really cool. So the collar, a collar on a tree is where this is a collar. So right where a branch comes out. So if you imagine your neck coming out of your shoulders. Um, Max was explaining to me a little bit about where you want to prune and why. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure we don't do a good job of that around my house. Yeah, and there's a lot of rules of thirds. Um, like the, what you cut has to be, what's left has to be at least a third of the size of what you cut and I don't know, all kinds of interesting rules to follow. Like survival of the fittest in my yard. <laughs> Just like, I don't like this branch. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of wrapping. Mm -hmm. So this project isn't necessarily hard, except that it's a lot of wrapping. You need to be it's good at it's time consuming. Um, skill um, level. Um, but even the wrapping isn't as precise as like sometimes when we're doing little animals and stuff. You re your wrapping really has to be on point. Um, this has more room for variation um, and it's not like super refined you know so I would say if you watched you like look through the video familiarize yourself with everything that's happening I'm not completely teaching from a level two <laughs> standpoint but I do think a level two person could I would consider this a level two project. Totally attainable if you just, you know, if you take your time and figure everything out. But not as simple as just follow along step by step, um, you know, chicks or. All right, one more. What the tree do when the bank closed? <laughs> uh, I don't know what. It started its own branch. What an incredible structure, though. I mean, you know, we refer to it, like all these proverbs, and we refer to it in yoga, you know, and, and, and it just in life of, of, you know, rooting ourselves and branching out and um, our family tree, it just, just goes on and on. 
All right, it's time to put some bark on. So we're gonna work on the bark and then I have a tree on which I'm going to use autumn <laughs> locks and I'll demonstrate on the green tree how the leaves work and then on this one I'm going to use the yarn. So I'm going to show all of the foliage fiber possibilities. Here's my bark and what I've been doing is sort of eyeballing um, the the length. You couldn't you couldn't measure. This is about six inches, and then the width around. Now, when I cut for this initial piece, I'm looking for interest, and also I want a little bit of flare because I want that first piece to um, and and sort of encapsulate this this um, root flare here. So I have some fabric scissors. And I think I'll work over here. And you want some overlap. Um, like you want it to go around and overlap a little bit so that when you needle felt it, it's you know, enclosed. And then let, you know, all the little weird things that are happening. Let them do interesting things. Now I want to accentuate this bend, so I'm gonna really felt it around that. And you could you could intentionally, you know, make make dents. Um, you know, we have these shapes down here. I could feel for the shapes and needle felt. This is where that 36 comes in handy. I'm not using a 36 right now, but I will get one. And really like shape it around. those shapes that we made. Really watch your fingers. It's easy on this project to go through it. These white spots are from me having cold wax on my hands. Now, if we want to make a wound, like a little hole in our tree, <laughs> we're going to find a spot to cut our, let's see, let's do it right here. We're going to cut our, our wet felted, we're going to give it a wound, basically. We're going to cut our wet felted piece and try to felt it sort of back on itself a little bit so that it turns in. So you can let that brown show or you can put a little bit of black in there. So it can have, you can have a lot of fun with that. And then as you move up the tree, you've got to, you've got to be, you know, a little creative with your, um, 
with your pieces. So I try to go sort of up. Let's see. Let's look. Let's look at this one on the overhead because this one's pretty elaborate. I totally can't see because there's like light in my eyes, <laughs> but hopefully, hopefully you guys can see. So I just kept using, oh, at one point I cut strips of bark and wrapped, like wrapped the limb with a strip. So that gets a little bit easier as you get up here, but on this part, anything like at the base of it, I would try to use a whole piece. So I'll demonstrate, I'll demonstrate that. So I'm going to use one more whole piece up here. Just to get around this part. I really, I like this because the whole point is the irregularity. So it's very freeing, <laughs> you know, like I have a weird piece of yarn right here and that's okay. Okay. grab it and like twist it, see if it does anything interesting when I do that. All right, so I'll demonstrate wrapping. Um, I'm just gonna cut about a three quarter inch strip. And then start it somewhere and then wrap my branch with my bark. And it, like I said, it's safe to do about two thirds because your foliage is gonna be more out on these tips. So this question seems so obvious. Okay. But then when I really think about it, is it obvious if a tree falls in a forest and no one's around to hear it? Does it make a sound? Right. Well, that's why it's a thing. <laughs> right. But it's like, duh, of course it does. Well, that is like does a, it? That is a great um, analogy for anything that we don't witness, you know, or see or faith or anything like that. I love this so much. If I weren't um, making a tutorial, <laughs> I would maybe like spend a little more time fringing out my edges and, but, um, cause it will blend a little better if you fringe your edges out. But there's a lot that I would sort of fuss with and do that I know you will figure out. You would do more stabbing? I would do more stabbing, yeah. I'm just trying to keep things flowing here. Probably use a little bit of this. Oh, I just pulled like all the wool off and all I left was yarn. Sometimes you need the single needle to really target
So people want to make sure it's stuck and also shaped how they want. Mm -hmm. Shaped. Like with their indents and... Yes, yes, yes. The branches, like I said, are going to get handled a lot and you'll be able to like... Even when the tree's completely finished, you can shape your branches however you'd like to. So I have a little bit of a space here. I'm just going to take some fiber and span that so it doesn't have a gap. Hmm. What? It is only the fruit-laden tree that receives the shower of stones from passers-by. That's sad. So if your bark develops a wrinkle or an interesting bend, I would exaggerate it. Like our tendency would be to smooth it out. I would make it more pronounced. Now where the bark fabric meets the roots, we can take a little bit of our bark fiber and just do one of these where you start on there, go around the root, and then finish onto the, onto the fiber. And that'll bring everything together. I'll show that again. Just hold it. Well, this one actually I can probably felt around. This one I like what the, how the bark fabric is meeting the root. So I'm just gonna leave that one like that. But this one definitely needs Definitely need some fiber here. How do you properly identify a dogwood tree? By its bark? Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. If you wanted to like wrap your tree in a really dark color like, or contrasting color and then pull it out where the reverse needle and then stab it back in, that would be another way to get yet another texture. All right, I think this is really fun. Um, I'm happy with the way that it's looking. And like I said, I would spend a lot more time kind of playing with this and neatening things up. But as long as my branches are kind of wrapped, you know, a third to the half of the way out, that's good. I see I'm going to do, I'm going to do this one right here. I see. And then I will switch to away from the um, wet felted fiber and to just my, my bat here. But the wet felted bark does add quite a bit of thickness to, so just keep that in mind when you decide to stop wrapping with your core.
that thin yarn looks really cool in there. Yeah, it does. And it's hard. Like it's, you kind of have to get up close to, to these to appreciate mm -hmm. everything that's happening. All right. Wacky cherry blossom achieved. It's time to make foliage. Wow. <laughs> Okie dokie. <laughs> this is okay. So I have some green yarn. I have some pink yarn. I have fiber, um, autumn fiber art locks and or your fiber fairy giveaway locks, which are slightly different, but the same, same kind of thing. And I have the green wet felted fabric, which I'm going to show you how to prepare. Uh, we have these scissors on our goods and faves page and they are a wave pattern sort of pinking shear or scalloped scissor. And they have made this a lot easier <laughs> because if you don't have these, what I was doing was going out and in, you know, every sort of half inch which works, um, it's just tiring and time consuming. So with these, I can cut the fabric and it does it automatically. Because we're looking for this irregular pattern. When we cut these into little sections, then it automatically looks leaf-like versus little squares sticking off or anything else. So that's how we begin to prepare the green leaves. And then we want to take these and cut. I found that if I cut at an angle, then I ended up with a leaf shape on each side. You'll find this spacing. It's sort of like every third bump, every second bump. Chinese proverb, mm -hmm. keep a green tree in your heart and perhaps a singing bird will come. Mm. I like that a lot. We are the key to our own. That's sort of a law of attraction kind of thing. Mm -hmm. like. So once you have all these little, all these little leaves, <laughs> so, so many leaves, but not nearly, probably not a tenth or a hundredth of what is on a tree, um, then we want to start making branches. And what I found <laughs> that works, works the best So this is, interestingly enough, speaking about nature, like mimicking itself, it's the feather technique. It's the plumage technique. And and, and so it's funny, like wool so easily mimics, wool fiber so easily mimics feathers. And now, I don't know, I don't know. It just, it all overlaps and it's fascinating. Okay, I'm gonna use the um, heavier gauge. Sorry, that's really probably very loud. Um, the <laughs> Let me just open my candy bar. <laughs> I'll just get them out so we don't have to do that again. Okay, so I'm, I have the thinner gauge and the heavier gauge um, tacky wrap sticks. Alternatively, alternately, alternatively, alternatively, or <laughs> use also or <laughs> um, 
26 gauge is great. Um, we have, yes, just check out the wire uh, choices. There's a lot of, lot of options there. Now with the 26 gauge, okay, let me also get a 22 gauge so you can see. The 22 gauge is fairly strong and I can make additional branches um, using 22 gauge for sure. The 26 gauge works as well and I'm gonna cut this in half. Trying to remember if I was doing, now I'm trying to remember my own technique. Okay, so to start, I'm gonna take two sets of leaves fold this over and pinch them and give myself a good three quarters of an inch or so to wrap that, you know, to enclose them. And then I want to do that, I don't know, every inch and bring the wire together and give it a twist. Put some leaves in, bring the wire together and give it a twist. I prefer odd numbers, but no easy way to do that. So we're doing, doing groups of two, which gives us four, four leaves. Okay. Now, the easiest thing to do is before we add this to the tree is to take a thin strip of our bark color and cover this wire. So I think it's easier to roll than wrap because when you roll, you can very easily get right up to that leaf and then skip over it in between it to the next leaf, skip past that, get to the next one, skip past that. It's hard to take the fiber around, like around, around. It's easier to keep the fiber in place and roll the wire into the fiber. Now, when we get towards the top, I wanna to pull as much off as I can, twist this around, and then I just felt this little bit of bark fiber right into the leaf bundle to hold, to hold everything together. And you don't see it. Um, it just disappears. So that's how we make a little addition to our tree. And then you find a place for it. And so I need one on the end here. And then I wrap this wire around that. like that. Okay, that's the leaves. If you're making something like a weeping cherry, or a pine tree. Okay, so we pass me the pine. Um, it's right here, this one, this end one. Every, sorry to be jumping around a bit, but each tree kind of has, you know, a way to use the same techniques. So this is a pine armature. Um, so I made, I used three 24 gauge wires, did the same thing, roots, I twisted them, but I twisted them together all the way up. I didn't branch out. And then I added two more 14 gauge wires. So same thing, three 12 gauge, two 14 gauge. And then I did let those, I think these are probably the two 14 gauge. I let them each be a branch, twisted down the trunk and came out. Five roots at the minimum is what you need to keep your tree stable. 
Then I took 14 gauge wire and I made, you know, incrementally smaller lengths and went, just took one, you can see here, like here's one. This is all one wire and just went boop around the tree. I mean, I could even wrap this one again to make sure it's nice and um, nice and tight. Probably two wraps is better than, than just one. So when we make leaves for a pine tree, we're not looking at a canopy out on the final third. We're looking more at like two thirds of it kind of being along the whole, the whole branch. So I think I mentioned if I were making a white pine, for example, I would, um, let's see if I have anything that would work for that. All right, I would take a thinner wire, like the um, 32 gauge that's in the tacky wrap sticks. And one possibility is instead of cutting it in half, I would fold it in half. And then I would take my locks and use the, use the feather technique. So give it a twist and then put another lock. Give it a twist. Now in this case, I don't think I would try to wrap it with bark color. So now we're making more of like a a long row instead of a branch, we're making like a row of foliage. More like the feather. Yeah, more like the feather. I haven't made a pine tree by the way yet. I'm just, I'm experimenting on the tutorial. Always exciting. <laughs> Okay, so you have this big, floofy, fuzzy thing. And then you keep going. And then I would take that and just wrap it around this limb. Maybe, I think you have to space it out a little bit more so that each time you go around, you know, maybe one of these, so maybe put them more like an inch apart. And then one of these will stick up. And so on a white pine, these orient upwards on something like a, I will just use half a thing because I'm gonna, um, on something like a Norway spruce, Same technique. Now, I did decide, what did I say? A little bit more like um, three quarters to an inch in between. This is how you could do the weeping cherry as well. And I will show that as well. Or, or a um, weeping willow. Why was the weeping willow sad? I don't know why. It watched a sappy movie. <laughs> All right, so we make a f this frond, basically, and then we're going to go around, wrap around. I'm going to try and orient these down. So I want that one down there. And then I go around and I want that one down there. And then I go around and I want that one down there. So I'm orienting them more um, hanging down. 
like that. <laughs> that looks good. Yeah. So that's for a pine, though. The um, you know, we're going out these branches. And we might need to you might need to add a few offshoots to make it look nice and full. It's it is a process. It is definitely a process. Okay, that is the green. Now, the autumn tree, I haven't put the bark on this yet, but I will do one autumn one. I would approach as I'm going to do the um, cherry blossom, and as I did this, this green, I'm calling it a maple tree, but so with the locks, and like I said, you can get the locks in different colors. Putting locks every couple of inches, or I mean every inch or so. Pick out some fun colors, mix them up. Oh my gosh, so fun. The locks are like sort of do kind of mimic leaves, especially if you get a nice bunch that's like really well defined. I wouldn't put too much fiber in here because the locks sort of speak volumes and you don't want to, you know, waste, waste it. Um, now with this, if I needed to, I could wrap around a branch, but mostly I'm kind of making with these, I'm making branches. So I'm, I'm taking the, the bow that's here and then adding a foliage, you know, twig to it. So let's get our bark color on there. This is just like the, the green one. What, what type of tree fits in your hand? It's a little bit harder to get it work around the locks. Um, what type of tree fits in your hand? A palm tree. Yes. It's just a little fussy. <laughs> 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 but I hope that you guys are like me and find it the end result so wonderful and the process so enjoyable that you don't mind kind of, I mean, I think most people don't. I think I'm, I'm, everyone's like, oh, you're so patient. No, I think I'm on the more impatient side and, um, or maybe just the people who say that to me don't know me very well, but it is very, it is enjoyable and, and you are like, in kind of in charge of this enchanting world that you're creating. This is the kind of project you can be doing once you have your plan and you're just working away that you can have music on, you can have yeah. a podcast yeah. on, something that you, not that it's um, mindless activity, but right. it's just kind of staying, staying busy in a good way. I'm not going to go farther with this one because this tree doesn't have its bark on it yet. So I'm, you know, the pine tree is the least complete because I, I wanted to show how the wires were on there um, and how the armature was built. So it's, it's it, this is very incomplete and I don't really know what kind of tree I'm making yet. Once, I meant to back up a little bit, once you have your... Um, your 14 gauge wires on, you can take these 26 gauge wires and go make sure you have a little bit of 
oops, um, cloth covered wire on here. So get all of these, go across your tree and get all of these covered with some cloth covered wire. That's going to make wrapping everything much, much easier. Okay, so what I have not made yet is a cherry blossom with this house dyed pink yarn. And so as we're experimenting here, I need to figure out how long do I want these pieces of yarn to be and do I want to mix in a green lock or a leaf, you know? I think I want a little bit of green in there. I think the, the, the flowers come first and then the leaves come. I know on my Weeping Red Bud, it is all flowers, no leaves, and then the leaves come. So, I'm a little worried that if I cut these small, it's gonna be very fussy. So what I might do is cut them sort of twice as long as I think they need to be, put them into the wire like this by folding it over, then I can go back and trim that if I need to. But I think that's gonna be easier than picking up teeny tiny pieces. Let's do it both ways. So here's the teeny tiny pieces way. Okay, here's the long way. So let's take this other half. When I use the 32 gauge, I fold it in half. It's, it's um, not really strong enough to do anything if you were to do it where you start at the end, unless you were taking this whole thing and wrapping it around something else. So, all right, teeny tiny pieces away. Just to put that in there. Give it a twist. It's not that bad to pick up little pieces, but is that the right length? I think that's the right length to make little poofs. Now, this is on the thin side, this whole thing. So I'm actually gonna wrap it around a twig instead of trying to make it its own twig. The problem with wrapping it around a twig is that then you have to wrap the bark around it. I'll show you. So many different uh, techniques I tried. So there's a cherry blossom strand. And when I'm saying I'm gonna wrap it around here, I mean I'm gonna go around this branch that's already here. But be careful about doing this too much because I think the better technique is to make branches because that's how it works, right? The, the flowers don't come off of, you know, these bigger branches. All right, let's try it the other way then. But this does work for the weeping cherry because you have all these long pieces coming right off of that. So it's kind of a combination of making you know a few wires that have a bunch coming out that you wrap around a branch and making some that are their own individual branches i, I can't give you a totally um tried and true path because there's so many ways to do this so and so many different tree types and sort of effects that we're going for. I 
out. Yeah, I don't know about putting a little bit of green in here. I think you want them to be very small. Mm -hmm. Where do saplings go to learn? Um, I don't know where. Elementary school. <laughs> Talbot made up a joke when we were having lunch or off off camera. He said, "What's a tree's favorite soda?" And I didn't get it. I didn't either. It's very good. Bark's root beer. It's a good one. Oh, whoops, I forgot to wrap my branch. Is Barks everywhere or is that is it local? I don't know. They sell it on Amazon, so it's everywhere. Coca-Cola. <laughs> is ah. it Coke? Created by Edward Bark, B-A-R-Q. Well, it's been around quite a while. I feel like this is coming across as extremely time consuming. <laughs> <laughs> but I did all these trees, you know. It, I think once you get rolling. Yeah, yeah. Like figure out what you're doing. Really, and I'm showing a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Like when you're just doing like the one thing. You'll, you'll get underway and it won't be so crazy. Oh, I really, I really like this though. This is going to be a really fun, fun tree to make. All right. I'm, I'll be back in about two days. <laughs> With a finished tree. Is there anything that you think I need to show that I'm not showing? Once the wire's on. Once the wire's on, you might have some branch wrapping to do. Yeah. yeah. So like the big version of the little ramp wrapping you're doing there. Yeah. yeah. Wrapping <laughs> over. Wrapping over everything. Now here's another thing you could do. You could work from both ends. So... And make two branches at the same time. So, what? I know. So I'm gonna this. So I'm gonna make a poof on each end. The tacky wrap, the dark tacky wrap stick is a little extra tough with these light pink um, colors. What do you like better, the short pieces or the longer pieces? I think I like the longer pieces. That one squoes very well. Okay, so you come in. Oh, that was a lot of poof right there. I put a quadruple one. So you come in from both ends. I mean, it doesn't matter. You still have to make as many, <laughs> as many poofs. So I've got three little flower poofs on each one. Okay, I'm going to wrap it. Whenever I'm wrapping something end-to-end, -end, I start in the middle. It's just easier for me. Um, I feel like it's easier to hold the wire than trying to start from, from an end.
The yarn is a little harder to get to stay out of the way than the green leaves. Like you're like, where does this piece go? Where does this piece belong? But it is a little addicting. Like once you start adding these to the tree and you're starting to see it come together, it's like, ooh, I get to keep making this happen. The more you space out your little um, plumage or foliage additions, the easier it is going to be to wrap the bark color around it. Okay, so now you have poofs on each end and you can just take it, go around your, um, go around your branch and then you have two, you know, two little branches. Probably would do that again, but use a whole, use a whole piece. We're making progress, making, making blossoms. Twisting twigs. You're, you're blossoming. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, have a couple of things to share about the, the process. This is the first time I've made the cherry blossom and the amount of yarn in, in the giveaway and that ultimately we hope to sell is, is great, especially for the, you know, the blossom versus the weeping cherry. You might need a little more when you go long for the weeping cherry. But, and then the pack of tacky wrap sticks, I'm using the 26 gauge to make, I'm working from each end and I'll show it in the overhead um, to make basically a set of two branches that I can twist around a limb. So I'll show that. And then with the, all of the um, 32 gauge, I'm cutting them in half and making either smaller double ones. Oh, that was two. Smaller double ones or single ones just to add. So the pack of tacky wrap sticks is perfect. You might also need, you know, some extra 22 gauge for the armor, actual armature construction. So just an update on how I'm finding the supplies are working and the technique. I did decide that I like the longer, the longer cut, and then I'm just taking them and folding them in half. And I'm doing, I'm doing two at a time, but you could do three here and there, get a little bit of a poofier bunch. So let's do a three one. And I'm not even worrying about cutting the little loop. I'm just letting that be as it is. I don't think it's, you could, but I don't think it's even integral to the design. And you could alternate the folds so that you have a folded one and cut ends going each way. But even that I'm not being too particular about. So this is a branch with all of the blossoms in a row. And now I'm going to make a branch where I let it section off into two, into two branches. So I start the same way. Just the more variation you can achieve as you go in little ways, the better. The more that you keep everything symmetrical and the same, kind of the more you're going to be fighting an, uh, an organic look. So I can do a few. And then... I can decide that this is going to branch off a different way. So 
just by wrapping it back on itself. So now I have a double branch on the end. There's a lot of different ways to, <laughs> to get arrive at that same result. Chinese proverb. Okay. Looking for fish? Don't climb a tree. <laughs> Maybe unless that tree branch happens to be hanging over yes. a river full of fish. Ooh, what? Mistrust is an axe in the tree of love. Oh, <laughs> that is on point. You circle that one for me. <laughs> I wrote a whole blog about trust. It is really kind of the same as love because it, we think of it as something like that someone's going to offer to us, like I trust you, you know, mm -hmm. which they can't, you can't develop that. But I think it's also, it's got to come from within yourself. Do I trust myself? Do I trust myself to handle being vulnerable? Do I trust myself to handle hardship that comes my way? And love is the same way. It's really coming out of you. And that stemmed, that conversation with myself and the blog post stemmed from dating sites because it's a big thing that people like, you know, I need trust. <laughs> it's not a bad, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's just. Right. Well, if someone breaks, well, if someone breaks your, their word <clears throat> repeatedly or does something and you can't trust them, that's a problem. Yes. But then everybody's going to mess up sometimes. Yes. <laughs> so I worked on this um, for about an hour, I'd say, adding these blossoms just to give you an idea of the timing. I do find once you get going, it's, um, it's very rewarding and pleasing, like to, to make these little branches and see, you know, then decide where you're going to put them and see it start to bloom right in front of your eyes. English proverb, some men go through a forest, yet see no firewood. Okay. I mean, not great for the tree, but yeah, don't miss opportunity. And that's one of those cases where I don't mind that they didn't say women. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind being excluded from that one. The tree makes shafts for axes. Whoa. Whoa. That, that's <laughs> deep. <laughs> what, where does that proverb come from? It is, it is not identified. So this was a 26 gauge uh, wire. So I'm going to find where I want to put that. I think I had a place picked. Oh, this this branch needed one right here. Mm. 
So yeah, I will continue on with these smaller, smaller wires, just making more and more branches, adding them, you know, here and there to fill this out and make it nice and full. But um, in the meantime, instead of you watching me labor away, I'm going to show uh, just some finishing touches. So the, the mini stab, it's great because when I'm not worried about you guys seeing, I can like kind of get the roots down off my, off the desk, rest, the, rest the tree onto the mini stab it and work on my, my bark and, um, you know, get everything tightened up as it needs to be. And then after your branches are on, you're going to have these, these places where it's, you know, wire wrapped on your core wrapped branch. So if I really want to be uh, very finished about it all, I'm going to take my a section of my bark color and go around the branch using the bark color and covering the brown core and covering the wire that is twisted onto the tree branch. And you can do this as you go, like if you finish a branch, or you can do it at the end. I kind of like to add blossoms all over so I see how many I have and if it's balanced. If you were to just do one branch, you know, you either might run out or you might not build them the same. So I like to bounce around. That's kind of my thinking behind that. This fiber also is really securing the, the branches that you've wrapped, the twigs that you've wrapped around the branch. Because they are just wrapped around here so they could twist and sort of devolve. And it is a little detail, but it really gives it a nice finishing touch. Why isn't the squirrel hard at work collecting acorns at the oak tree? I don't know. Why? She called in sick and went to the beach. <laughs> beach trees are fascinating. They have um, like a smooth gray bark. They're the ones at Fair Hill that you see like people's initials are carved in. Mm -hmm. and, they're, mm -hmm. and they hold their leaves for a long time. So they'll have these golden orange leaves sort of sometimes throughout the winter, even though everything else has fallen to the ground. So that's what we're going to do branch by branch. And then when everything is, I feel like I need another little, little sprig off of here. So I have plenty and I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to keep adding them. But when everything is, finished. Um, I mean, that's it really. Just make sure you cover all your, all your wires and secure everything. Oh, another, another step that I did do on these trees that I didn't do on this was to felt a, um, I'll just do it real quick with your core. You can use your core scraps. It's a great way to use your core scraps. And I'll just use a piece of core also. But felt a flat poof a couple of layers thick, and that helps stabilize um, the bottom of the tree here. And I, I really should have done that before I did the finishing touches to the um, to the trunk. And the roots. You got that Talbot? I messed up. 
Uh, I missed a step. And you then, just continue to instruct people that they should watch the whole tutorial I know, first before I know. they do it. I know. I try so hard. And then this, you want to stab onto the bottom here. Uh, it's awkward, so I'm not going to make you watch the whole thing. But just keep going. Watch out for your wires. Just let the needles bounce. So this is part of the core step. And then your trunk and your bark and your roots get all, all finished. I would do that more and have it all blend in. But it does give some stability to the base of the tree. So I hope you guys have enjoyed the tree tutorial and it brings all of this together. <laughs> so many, so much potential um, your way. Please be aware of your color scheme, what kind of tree you want to make. But even though, you know, it's important to have a reference and have an idea, I really encourage you to go a little bit free form, especially to start until you get a feel for how the armatures work, how it all comes together, and then you can hone in on it and refine it more and more, which is kind of how the progression has been for me. I'm excited to finish the pine, so hopefully I can, I can do that because I haven't done that yet. And explore the bark texture. I, if I were to make another one right now, I probably would go a little bit more um, experimental on the bark texture and colors as well, looking at birch or sycamore and trying maybe some neps and definitely with the, um, with the particular fiber that I used in the tutorial, some wool on the top to really help it all stick together because it doesn't felt very well on its own. So those are some of the things that I'm picking up, uh, you know, through making my fourth tree or fifth, if you count the, the wisteria, um, throughout the tutorial. We, whenever we make a tutorial, we have to weigh out, do we want a kit? Um, I feel like there's so much variation in size, scale, color, season, that I don't see making a kit, but we want to regularly offer what you need to make the tree, including in the form of a boodle. So we'll probably change those seasonally. So in addition to the wires that you might need, the boodle would have sort of color, color schemes and either green yarn, pink yarn, or locks. I doubt we would do the wet felted leaf as a boodle, but it's, it's, you know, everything is just potential for you to take it and run with it. Um, I think these are beautiful just as a home accent. I could see them lit. I could see them, you know, as more of a concerted effort to make a bonsai, a wool bonsai. I could see them with, um, with some of our, you know, to scale with some of our other projects that we make in storybooks. <laughs> I just, they're, they're delightful and I'm having a lot of fun making them. I can't wait to see what you guys make. Um, if you have enjoyed the tutorial and want to subscribe, it's a great way to stay informed with what's going on. And you can hit the subscribe button on our channel and the bell um, gives you a notification when we come out with new tutorials. We also have a Facebook group that is a lot of fun, very welcoming, um, you know, a great place to share, to ask questions. It's called Serafina Felting Fanfare. So I hope you check that out if you're not involved there already. And we regularly do live streams and they are a great way to engage and share in the craft also. So thanks so much for checking it out. I can't wait to see your trees. Mm -hmm.